Okay, now we're into Emacs again um, to continue with uh, the chapter four, Compositional and Algebras, um, looking at some Haskell code to complement the Jamboard presentations. So this is the third part of the first lecture of week four. Uh, the first part on Jamboard was the definition of the predicate age two in friends for homomorphism of two argument functions, one argument function and zero argument functions. And we'll go into the definition later more. And then um, 412 on Jamboard was examples, both proving that odd, uh, that number, the, the predicate that checks if number is odd or even, is a homomorphism, and the proof that is prime is not homomorphism. Okay, so let's now take this definition of H2 and try to put it in Haskell. And we can't quite do it because Haskell doesn't have the for all, but we can do some similar thing and we can test it. So first of all, here is a definition with a lowercase h, and that's because the uppercase would not be allowed because Haskell requires definitions of functions and values to have lowercase, the starting letter and the uppercase is reserved for types and type classes. So um, the first part here is a type, and that's actually four lines long. The part which was not visible on Jamboard is a bit interesting. So that's equality on B. <coughs> so uh, the function that we want to check if it's homomorphism or not, the F here was called H in the definition on the Jamboard. It's a function from A to B. Then we got an operator on type A, an operator on type B, and we return an equality test. Something that given two A values would say either true or false. And this equality check on two values of type A requires an equality check on two values of type B for its definition. So this is something where Haskell comes in handy. It might not be obvious from the other definition that we actually require something from the type B it can't be just about anything. If the type B doesn't have a natural sense of equality, then it's not quite clear what this homomorphism concept means at all. So it's useful to be uh, careful here. So let's see. I've written H2 given three arguments. So it's, it's a very higher order function. It has three function arguments and returns a function. So the first function argument is called f, it could be called h just as well. And then I'm actually binding the name plus locally for whatever is the second argument to h2. So this means that after the equality sign, plus will not mean the usual plus from the standard prelude, but whatever was the second argument to h2. Similarly, the multiplication sign here is just a variable name in this definition on the left hand side so that any third argument to h2 will be bound to star. Uh, I should mention that when I write it on the Jamboard and so on, I write it taking a triple of arguments. So I usually actually write it like this up here. It has the, the type here should actually ideally be a cross, a cross product. So one type cross uh, another type, cross an, a third type, um, and then uh, the rest. But here I'm not using the cross product, I'm using the trip three arguments instead. So let's see, this is actually then, I was writing it on the whiteboard as, on the Jamboard as A to B cross A to A to A cross B to B to B to prop. And the, I mean, one could definitely have a variant of this where it would just be using three separate arguments instead of one triple. Um, so that's the transformation I did as a first part of getting it into Haskell. Uh, the other part is that instead of for all here, 
the for all quantification over x and y, which I cannot implement, I've said, okay, let's do the something similar or, or at least close to it. So x and y are now two parameters and then comes the property that should hold for all x and y. So to sum up, the Haskell approximation here, h2 of the real predicate mathematics predicates or logic predicate capital H2 takes the usual three parameters, two more parameters which are for x and y, and checks if the left hand side, so f applied to x plus y, equals the right hand side, f, f times x, f of x times f of y, for this particular pair of x and y. Um, and if I go back to the real predicate H2 up here, its definition should then be for all x, for all y, h2 of f plus times x and y. So I abstracted out this part of the body. As I said, we can't in general implement for all. So let's see, we've loaded this file and we can check, well, the type of h2 will be the type, oh, uh, why did it? Not like this. Uh, <clears throat> I probably haven't reloaded after I defined it. So the type of H2 begin code. Oh, okay. I I don't know. It was. It had some other file loaded. So the type of H2 we've already seen, so I don't need to repeat it, but we know that Haskell accepts the type and the definition. And now we can try to see if we want to apply it to something, what does come out. So I'll, I'll keep this one and the, the sort of math definition visible and then try to, okay, I said the math definition visible, so let's scroll up a bit. Adjust this. Okay. So now for some some actual tests. If you remember correctly, um, we had H two for the first case, the first example in four one two. Uh, we tried to show that H two of odd addition and XOR holds. So first, just to build this up, let's define XOR. So XOR is the exclusive OR. So we had this table. Uh, I can actually sort of show the table here. So the table had false, true, true, and false for the inputs, false, true. Let's try to make some ASCII art here. False, true. So this is the operator XOR. So it can be implemented in different ways. I mean, one way is just to, as an illustration of a simple Haskell program, to implement false, false. I mean, the, the table, um, table in here. So false, false should be equal to false. Let's see if we can approximate the table a bit. X or uh, false, true equals true and then x or true false equals false and the last case true true equals false so this is a an ascii art like implementation of xor we can try it um, xor false true whatever that that is a working definition uh, but I will actually move this definition out before the begin code because there is a shorter definition. So we've, uh, because it, it sort of is pre predefined in the prelude. So we can see that essentially what this is checking is that the two values are different. So we can implement it as not equal. So XOR is actually implementable as the operator not equal. Let's try XOR again of the same false and true and it's still true and yeah all the other values work as well so this is not equal for bool okay so 
we said that we wanted to see if we can test the h2 where we have odd plus an xor. So my test here is a function where I've applied partially the h2 predicate helper to odd plus an xor. And this is still a function. So my test here, if I try to show it, it is a function from two integer values to a boolean. So I need to apply it to say three and four or zero and zero or zero and one to test it. And, and clearly uh, I, I don't get the for all thing here. I can't test it for all possible values, but ideally it should be equal to the function which is constantly always true for all inputs x and y. So um, at the least I can do is to try it for, for a number of uh, values. I mean, now we've tested it. We, we know that it's actually enough to test it for four values, the sort of last bit being zero and one. But uh, as usual, uh, proving is stronger than testing. Okay, so this is a way of testing these functions. And the other case I had was with primality checking. And here it's actually enough to do testing because remember um, we said that we can't prove, we can prove that there is no function uh, so such that um, is prime is a homomorphism from plus. So this is one test is to check if XOR happens to be that function. So no, notice. Let's, let's put it as a comment here. Note not the whole proof. So, but let's first test this one. So, reload and check uh, what is my test two. Well, it's also an integer to integer rule. I uh, like to test the type better in this way. So, I'll just use the type synonym z. Okay, a bit shorter. My test two, and if I test that one, my test two on two and two, it says true, and two and three, it says false. So notice here, false means that actually this predicate, where I'm checking if XOR is the right function, that is falsified by one single test. Because remember, uh, the actual property the, prop, the, the real H2 property has two for alls, thus can be disproven by just any pair of counter examples. Whoops. <clears throat> so, but what have we disproven? So, x equals 2, uh, y equals 3 uh, disproves this particular case. Which means um, x or is not the target of a homomorph of is prime as a potential homomorphism. But we still have lots of other possible functions. So remember the proof that we had showed that there is no possible implementation here. So actually Normally, we would have to have a proof because we wouldn't be able to test it. But we have a bit of a special case here. Because remember that the the operator XOR here. So if we make, uh, if we say my test 3, where we leave out the XOR. And then we think about what type this has. So the first argument here now is a B to B to B. So, um, and there is a finite number of values of this type. 
So we can actually enumerate all possible operators from bool to bool to bool, and then test all of them with, for example, this test case or some other test case. And if we find a single counter example for each candidate op, then we have shown that no such op exists, even without a sort of, I mean, a formal proof. And that's because there are just a finite number of options. We just enumerate them. Okay, so that's rather cool. Um, we can type check our predicates and we can actually value check. We can logic check them for a subset of the values. And in some particular cases, that may actually be enough to prove properties. So the let's just the, the my test three here. Note that it has three variables. It can be tested with XOR, uh, two, three. It can be tested with and two, three. So look, the, the counter example two, three was not a counter example for and. Maybe two, two is. Yes, okay. So two, two is a counter example for and. Two, three is a counter example for XOR, and so on. So one just has to find one counter example for each possible op. Okay, now to something a little bit different. Um, if we instantiate this age two, we can actually express the property that, for example, union, the syntactic union operator from the A2, A1 lab is a homomorphism. So assuming we have a definition like uh, uh, that we want, well, we can do it in this order. So the property that union of X and Y is a homomorphism for these two particular values, uh, or rather that eval is a homomorphism from the syntactic union to the semantic union for these two values. Uh, if we expand this definition, then this says that the eval function apply to union of xy. Remember here, x and y are of type, well, what was it, syntax tree, it was called term v, I think. Um, so for all syntax trees, if we do the, do the union of them, we should have uh, the result, this should be possible to evaluate x and evaluate y, and then do some semantic union for of the results. Um, here, I should also comment perhaps, for simplicity, I ignore env here. There is, there is another environment argument to eval, but let's just for simplicity ignore that here. So this definition actually, I mean, if, if I just define eval of union x, y to be this, then I've automatically satisfied the homomorphism condition. And this is a rather general uh, case we will look more into a little further down when we talk about uh, the, a simple evaluator. Uh, but it's also worth noting that some other properties uh, are not, don't hold for de by, uh, by definitions. And commutativity, for example, is one very useful property, which is not uh, uh, here a homomorphism property. Um, but there you actually need to provide a proof. The, the first one comes automatically, but the other one not. Uh, similarly, uh, the syntactic definition of eval for intersection, um, if it uses a semantic function intersem, then this actually, actually is exactly the form of uh, the H2 um, definition. So eval is a homomorphism from intersection as a syntactic operator to intersem. So something like H2 intersect, no, sorry, eval is the homomorphism from intersect to intersem. And this is fulfilled by definition. 
And in general, if we now move from the particular case of the assignment uh, to the general case, we have said many examples of this where we had an evaluator, some syntax tree, and some semantic domain, and where the first operator is a two argument constructor uh, of an add or mul, and then we have, on the other hand, a constructor in the semantic domain or a function, semantic function. Okay, that's enough for the first part. I'll stop the recording and continue uh, with the next part separately.